About six years ago, in August of 2015, I took a business trip to China with my friend and business partner, Kobe Bryant, Pete Del Grosso, and a few other colleagues. We had a number of meetings scheduled, but the one thing about travel in general, and travel to China specifically, is plans always change. A dinner with the CEO one evening was canceled last minute, so we found ourselves stuck eating dinner at our hotel in Shanghai. Over dinner, we caught up on business, family, and then shifted to one of our favorite topics, biology and nature. We talked anecdotes, fun stories, oddities of nature, concepts like how the cheetah uses its tail to stabilize itself as it leaps, how termites invented air conditioning, how ants created a version of the internet millions of years before humans did. But eventually, we moved on to my favorite topic, the human brain. Given my background studying the brain, it was always fun to surprise people with random anecdotes. It still amazes me how little people know about our most important organ, the one that makes us conscious and think and feel. The truth is, though, even experts don't know very much about the brain. As an example, when I was in graduate school, we thought there were about 100 billion neurons in the human brain. These are the fundamental building blocks, the computing units, and all you need to do is count the little buggers. But by my first book, the number had dropped. We overcounted, I guess. And by my second book, the number grew to about 85 billion neurons. We missed a few. So the most fundamental thing about our brains, something we just have to count, we don't really know. The thing that struck everyone most that night, though, was when I casually mentioned that regardless of the number of neurons, our brains are actually shrinking. Mind you, size doesn't really matter. We don't have the biggest brain in the animal kingdom. That honor goes to the sperm whale. And most brain scientists don't think absolute size matters at all. Rather, it's the size of our brains relative to our bodies, something known as encephalization. But even there, we don't have the largest encephalization. The tree shrew of all animals wins that award. But what does matter is how big our brains are compared to our ancestors. And for most of hominin history, our brains were growing, both in absolute size and in encephalization. And almost everyone agrees that the growth in brain size over the past few million years has been responsible for our growing intellect. As our brains got bigger, so too did our mind's abilities. And that's where things stood up until about 50,000 years ago, when things seemed to have gotten a bit weird. Somewhere around that time, our brains started to shrink, and not just by a small amount. I told the table that night to think of our brain as roughly the size of an American football. Over the last 50,000 years, we lost the size of a baseball in brain mass. A baseball. My colleagues were in disbelief. What? Actually, they almost seemed mad at me for even suggesting it. But eventually, someone asked the obvious question. Are we getting dumber? I said we don't know. It's possible that we're losing intelligence. But it's also possible that something else is happening. You see, brain size tends to follow body size, which is why encephalization is so important. And it's true that our body size is also getting smaller. But that can only be part of the story, both because our brains were previously outgrowing body size, and on a relative basis, our brains more recently were getting smaller as a percentage of body size. Our encephalization levels are actually shrinking too. There were plenty of theories to go around, and I shared a few of them. The most fun one was that some scholars believe we're getting domesticated. <laughs> There's actually strong evidence that brings the domesticated animals, horses, cows, dogs, cats, shrink as a result of domestication. They essentially lose their mammalian brains, the area that focuses on being in the wild. But that was unlikely for us, because humans seemed to have lost brain mass more broadly, and the decline has continued well past our supposed domestication. So Kobe did what I've seen him do so many times before. He put his hand on his chin, stroked his beard, stared me down, paid me a compliment, and challenged me to figure it out. So there I was in China with a challenge. I figured with the jet lag, I wasn't gonna sleep anyways, so I said I would see what I could come up with. That night, I scoured the internet, read every journal article I could come up with, and ultimately turned up empty-handed. I spent the next evening doing much of the same. And then went back with my tail between my legs and told Kobe I couldn't find anything. But 
I agreed to keep looking. Weeks later, same story. I researched every avenue I could find. Many scholars thought we were losing intelligence. Others thought it was body size. Some thought domestication, as I had said. A few thought it was structural, but most thought it was an anomaly just not knowable. But at least I had my answer. There was no answer. So I told Kobe, who didn't take it particularly well. He said to me, do you remember what I told you? It was a fair question. We were jet lagged and drinking really bad whiskey that night, but I remembered and I told him so. He looked at me, to be, to be fair, he looked down at me because we were standing and said, I didn't say, find out who has the answer. I said, find the answer. If no one's figured this out, you should. Now I had some pretty daunting PhD advisors at Brown and MIT, but Kobe was altogether different. He really didn't take no for an answer. And I don't know, was even worse. So I hemmed and hawed, reminded him we had a business to run, but reluctantly agreed to see what I could come up with. For years, my research became a running joke. Almost every time I saw him, and it didn't matter who we were with, he would ask, what have you got for me, Jeff? Everyone around us, even my team, figured he was talking about business, razzing me to deliver bigger returns or something. Truth is, neither of us cared to ask how the business was doing. Our business was doing amazing. There was no need to ask. No, Kobe was asking if I find an answer to the brain science question. And each time I would say, I've got nothing. It wasn't for lack of trying. I ran down every avenue. I started doing research in archeology, span paleontology, physical anthropology. I reached out to neuroscientists, geneticists, geochronologists, anthropologists. I would have talked to Harrison Ford if Indiana Jones was real. I started doing independent research measuring fossils, literally filling skulls with all kinds of substances to determine the size of the cranium and then convert that into brain mass estimates. I still have today what I believe is the largest collection of brain size data on the planet. But I didn't have answers. And then, with the help of a physiologist at Johns Hopkins Medical School, I found an answer. The physiologist, a guy by the name of Chris Ruff, is a leading scholar of bone and body mass changes in hominins. He wrote a seminal paper in Nature, including data about how our body size changes over time. He even had some data on brain size changes. Chris was kind enough to give me updated data on bone fragments and then formulas to convert them to body mass. And when I compared the body mass changes to brain size, sure enough, body and brain size correlated, even as the brain started to decline. As you can imagine, I was pretty excited. I shot Kobe a note, hey, we need to talk. We met at the Nobu in Newport Beach, which had just opened. And with a half moon smile, I fed him the answer. No, we're not getting dumber. It's just that our body sizes are shrinking and the brain generally follows body size, just like all organs, that simple. But Kobe's hand went back on his chin, sat for a few minutes thinking, as if there was something to think about. I spent nights and weekends, put off a book we were writing together. I lost sleep, but I found the answer. But when Kobe finally opened his mouth, all he said was, why? 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 Of course, why? How could I be so stupid? So what? Our brains are getting smaller because our bodies are getting smaller. Why are our bodies and brains getting smaller? Kobe, my PhD advisor, was right. I didn't answer the question at all. I just solved an interim step. So I responded the only way I knew how. More sake? And I drank. And then I Ubered myself home that night. So for the next few years, I continued to do research and continued to work on the problem, but I didn't get very far. I had ideas, but they were all just bad ideas. And then, early last year, I lost my friend and everything changed. It was devastating and it reminded me of the things that mattered most in my life. So, so I decided to reprioritize. Family and friends first. The business must go on. And I was determined to find an answer to why our brains are shrinking. So I put my hand on my chin and I told myself, you have one year, one year to find an answer. No exceptions. 
Over the course of the past year, I asked myself every morning the same question Kobe had asked of me. What have you got for me? And most mornings I came up blank, but I persisted. I continued to write journal articles to make sure that my thinking remained sound, and one day a criticism came back that gave me an idea. A reviewer asked if I had controlled for geography because different locations had very different weather, and weather happens to affect body size. It turns out that people who live in cold climates, such as Antarctica or Alaska, tend to be stockier than those who live in warmer regions. And this is true of the past as well. Hominins evolved to adapt to differences in geography because of regional climate. The reason for this is thermodynamics. Because our bodies produce so much heat, we need to regulate for different environments. Well, the brain is the biggest energy suck when it comes to all of our organs. Our brains weigh roughly 2% of our total body mass, but consume over 20% of our energy. So it's likely that our brains would also need to adapt to thermodynamic changes. If it were true for geographic differences, I wondered if it could also be true for climate change over time. I reached out to a few paleoclimatologists, and they provided me with millions of years of detailed sample data. You have to love scientists. Business people would never share data. Sure enough, there was a strong correlation between climate change and both body and brain size. During cooling periods, our bodies and brains were significantly bigger, and during global warming events, our bodies and brains shrank. There was over a 10% difference in size. Across the past 50,000 years, same pattern. And of course, during the most recent period of global warming, we should then expect both body and brain size to decline. And they did. There was a slight twist. Data is never clean in science. The last 1,000 years or so has shown significant decreases in brain size, but body size has actually grown. So our encephalization shrunk. But there, too, we found an answer. It turns out we're just getting fat. When you control for BMI or body mass index, the differences go away. So the answer is our brains are getting smaller because of global warming, and they're getting smaller relative to the body because our bodies are putting on excess fat. Yet another reason to rid the planet of climate change and obesity. There's much more to this story than science and finding the answer to our shrinking brains. It's also about how the best people push us to go deeper, be better. Just as in the game, Kobe pushed me further, made me dig deep on something in which I thought there was no answer, even though it was in my own field. He never took no or I don't know for an answer. Our best mentors do this for us. They push us, inspire us. We give far too little credit to those of us who teach, mentor, coach. We credit the individual with success, whether it's the scientist, the CEO, the star athlete, the politician. It's worth asking if the people behind the scenes are in fact more valuable. The people who nudge, push, motivate, drive others that really move this world forward. We should pay more credit to the teachers in our lives. And for my part, let this serve as a reminder of the good that my friend did in this world, both for others and for me. Thank you.